lot of organic cheeses in the food stores. The commercial dairy industry um, is dreadful on the animals' well-being. Um, they really steal their spirits and, and their the substances, the infections and, and the medications make their way into the milk. I think it, it's important that we talk to them. We try to, to tread lightly on the land here because we want this property, the Hamill family wants this property to be here for generations to come. This isn't just something where we're trying to make as much out of it now and trying to get volume going. We're real, really exciting to, um, to showcase what we have here. Did you see our carnivorous plants? I did not, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Part of this sustainability thing. Okay. We have flies, right? Because yeah. it's a dairy farm. Absolutely. So, uh, we're, we're partnered with Rand, uh, Rare Finds Nursery. They specialize in native carnivorous plants. Fantastic. So we have them here to help. I mean, this is a small number, believe me, but it helps and it's it's nice to educate people and to reconnect them with native plants yes. and the fact that plants have a purpose too. What goes into, um, cert, at least in New Jersey, for you guys, certifying the land organic? How long have you been an organic farm here? I think it's been about 10 years since the Hamels took it. This was leased land for a long time. And at a certain point when they inherited the property back again uh, from their father, they didn't want it to be leased land anymore. It had been a dairy farm for a long time and it was that intensive sort of industrial dairy farming. So it was beating the land a bit. So they decided to take it over and start doing something a little different. And we started bringing the land back and certification you have to fill out, reams of paperwork. And, and get yourself approved. I prove you're not putting anything on this. We do use some of the whey from the cheese making process as to put protein back in the soil as a fertilizer. Nice. The sustainable model, you know, where you're, you're taking everything and reusing it back on the farm to tread as lightly as possible on the land. Perfect. If it's a beef cow, then 10 to one, they're just not as friendly. Okay. And even in the dairy herds, you have some that are more placid and others that are a little more nervous. And, and we like, that's why we like the jerseys really, because they're such easy going cows. Okay. So do they come in right through this way or do they come no, in they from come the back? they come up from the back. They come up the, the road in the back and they come in through the back door there and then they get themselves all situated. And it isn't like we hand milk, there are machines, but you know, they're only 40. Cows. So they all get hooked up and they just stand there and do their thing. And those are the babies. You see the big guys? Yes. And they've got horns. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> and then the cats hang around. Certain, you know when it's milking time because the cats are here. And you know when uh, it's the end of the day in the cheese room because they're outside the cheese door waiting for cheese scraps. I was going to say, do they get a little, yeah. some treats? Yeah. If they're 80 cows, 40 of them right now are milking. Mm -hmm. And then they go into rest period and then the others have calves that come up. So you see calving now, and then you'll see, we'll have more calving in the spring. So the, you have a lot of interest, a lot of local interest. People yeah. want to come in and... It's a great opportunity for kids because an awful lot of kids don't know where their food comes from. They don't connect cows with hamburgers. Right. And if you're going to eat meat, at least understand where it comes from. If you choose not to, that's great. But if you're going to eat it, understand where it comes from. Right and what goes into making it. All right, so production today is Tuesday. We're making havala today. <laughs> havala. Havala is our most aged cheese, like up to 17 months. It has, it's the one over here in the case, and um, on the end, it has, you can see the rind is a little more developed, uh, and it gets those great little crunchies, those crystals in it that you get in a really good Parmesan cheese. Mm. It's so good, it's a great table cheese. Big fan, yeah. And this is one of the raw milk cheeses. These guys are all the raw milk cheeses. I have fresh cheeses over there. We do ricotta and cheese curds off and on, which is a very fresh cheese. And we do a brie, a blue ribbon winning brie. Mm. And then we have our, our more aged cheeses, like the Jack and the Rosedale. The Rosedale, one of the things we love about this, this is an Alpine style cheese, usually has some little holes in it. It's rind washed with uh, the apple cider from Terhune Vineyards, a little bit of organic thyme and some sassafras root. So you do eat the rinds with the raw milk cheese, yeah. as opposed to commercial cheeses where you have to cut the rinds a off? A lot of commercial cheeses, they wax, and we don't do that. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, you get a lot of flavor in the rind. Okay, so that's that's another big difference between yeah. Yeah. the cheese made with love and treated with love. And exactly. And we do try to focus, I mean, obviously we have our own things here, but we also try to focus on local or artisanally made products. So for example, we have those handmade cutting boards that are made by a local guy. Uh, he gets reclaimed wood and splices everything together. And we have local crafts from a couple of arts communities that we work with. Um, you said you do a lot of tours lately. We do, yeah. We, the Girl Scouts come, the Boy Scouts mm -hmm. come. We had a birthday party here recently. It's that holistic way of living. Absolutely. And we've forgotten because we've become so specialized and so efficient about everything. But if you think about this, this sustainable sort of holistic way of farming applies anywhere in your life. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, it just, it was something that, uh, it's been a movement, the awareness is coming around, but, um, but this sustainability, it, it, it's tangible now. Yeah. You know, but you, you've been here for a long time. It's not that you haven't been here. So I think it's just awareness. Exactly. Um, right. Of what's available. People come and then their friends come and we get to talk to them and they learn more about the farm and they get to watch the cheese makers and, and they become attached to the idea and part of our mission is to educate people, but not in a hard sell way. I mean, just to live it and mm -hmm. talk about it and... Live by example. Exactly. Yeah. The cows could really care less. They don't come up unless they think maybe you have food for them, but the goats, <laughs> they want your attention. And with the calves here, they'll lean out and it's like, hey, yeah. remember me? Remember me? Remember me? Yeah. Yeah. They really do enjoy interaction, I think. And we have these, these wooden things in here because in typical sort of mountain goat fashion, they like to perch up on top. Hi, right. oh. sweetie. And you have to have some serious fencing for goats because they will get out. They, they'll they climb. Jump. Yeah. Oh, sweet pea, how are you? So we've got the egg-laying chickens over there. <laughs> Excellent. And, uh, and then we have a heritage breed up there. So yeah, we have uh, the, the broiler, the meat chickens up there, but we're going to start collecting eggs from them. We have chicks up there right now, too. Oh, oh sweet. sweet. And then the pigs, they were out in the woods, but we're, we're redoing some of the pens out there because we want them to be... The idea on a sustainable farm is you're moving your animals around because if you just keep the cows here, pretty soon that's just mud. There's Overworked. nothing there. Right. So if you move them around into the different pastures, then you always have good pasture land, good grass. And it's the same with the pigs. You know, we switch them around a little bit. Do, do you feed, you? obviously the, the cows are feeding on grass, but you, do you supplement, like with horses, do you supplement with alfalfa or Especially in the Timothy winter when the grass is gone. And that's why you saw Brian bringing in hay earlier. Yeah. They're bringing in hay to get ready for these months when the, when the grass stops growing. Okay. So we can supplement with that. And they got a tiny amount of grain. They're, they're dairy cows, so you want to give them a treat to come into milk. So they get like a handful, but it's a non-GMO, non-corn grain, barley and things like that. And <clears throat> same with the chickens. You so, know. You're, so rather than in, in factory industrial farming where they're in stalls and it's, it's like it's stealing intensive. their spirit, here yeah. you're actually like your, like your family pets, you're luring yeah. them with treats like I do with my, with my dog. You yeah. lure them with yeah. treats and, and it, it's, it's a natural way of... Um, yeah. Factory farming is intensive. They yes. want high volume. Right. So to get high volume, they do what they have to do. Put them in a little stall, feed them um, the, the cheapest, you know, corn is rel or used to be relatively cheap. Feed them what you can, uh, keep them in a small space, keep them from moving around too much to keep them tender. Here, it's a sustainable farm. So they're doing their thing. Like the chickens are out there. We get scraps from a local juice place. We get the pulp right. and we feed it to the chickens. So they're, they're pecking around, they get bugs, they get, uh, you know, good vegetable compost kind of stuff. Right. We get brewer's mash from the local uh, brewery, beer place, to feed oh. to the cows in the winter when the forage goes away. We bring in these other things and it helps the community too because, you know, you're, you're not just throwing that stuff out or dumping it in a landfill. You're using it in some productive way. Exactly. Are you, um, there's the biggest buzz I've been, that you hear lately is the farm to table. Yeah phrase so and I see a lot of farms that are providing micro green uh, greens to the restaurants mm -hmm. so are you finding yourselves being approached by restaurants oh absolutely we sell wholesale to local restaurants we sell wholesale in uh, this area and in Philadelphia New York 
and we have some contacts in Boston right now. And it's always that farm to table small idea. We're never going to be industrial cheesemakers. Okay. We're never going to be industrial meat people. We make what we make. We focus on quality, not on quantity. And then they want to buy it and they only sell a little amount and it's seasonal. You know, you're yeah. not going to have this all the time, all year round. Right, which makes it so unique. I, I noticed that you're up at the Metuchen Farmer's Market, and I missed you this week. I yeah. wanted to step by and say hello. Who actually goes to the farmer's markets? Because it there are a few. Actually, Metuchen is Jessica, who's in here right now. She's, okay. she's doing some cheese cutting. Um, we have a couple different people who move through the markets. They, for the most part, also work on the farm in some way, so they have a real okay. connection to the farm, which I think is important. You know, I remember as a kid, my grandparents had the the, uh, the milkman who came, and you had yeah. the box, yeah. and and it would get cold, and the the um, the cream would pop the lid up. Okay. Well, I haven't had milk like that because I grew up in that homogenized, pasteurized milk world, which is really like white water. You come here, and it's thick, and there's texture, and we have Jersey cows, so it's high in butterfat. Jersey cows are known for their high fat content in the milk. It's, it's a whole different animal, and it's full mm -hmm. of all the good enzymes that help you digest milk, and uh, it tastes so different, the texture is so different. That, then, and that's something that people aren't really familiar with when you speak to the conventionally minded people, the commercially minded people, they don't understand raw milk, isn't that dangerous? They worry about germs. Yeah. yeah. They but, don't think about good enzymes, cooked food versus raw food. In raw food, you get more of the enzymes and the, and the more vitamins and, and all the health benefits of a food. Absolutely. It's, it's like olive oil, you know, good olive oil fresh off the tree, a whole different animal from what we buy in the store where all the benefits have already been heated out of it. Yeah, and when you speak to people who are old, el elderly, the, the people who are living into their upper 90s and in past 100, and they didn't have the same diseases at a young age, even in having the milk and cheese because they didn't have all the chemicals and the, the medication. <coughs> so, Sorry. yeah. And think about all the new, <coughs> the new problems we're having with uh, food allergies. Yes. And um, autoimmune problems, all these weird things that seem in the last 30 years to have just sort of taken over. I'm not convinced it doesn't have something to do with processed food and all the between the chemicals that we've put into our food and the benefits that we've taken out by processing. Absolutely. Is it about eating right? Is that going to be my priority? Is it about recycling? Is it about just kind of, you know, ramping down my lifestyle a little bit, and taking it a little easy? People pick and choose. The only way they're going to partake in it is if they understand it. Mm -hmm. We had a, a, a group of farmers from Korea come here because really? they wanted to see how a small American farm operated as opposed to the big industrial farms. So you're you're pretty progressive in terms of community outreach yeah. to some of yeah. the other farms. I think that's that's probably why you have such a great reputation beyond just the local community because yeah. you are reaching out beyond. We're a part of our community. Instead mm -hmm. of just being in our community, mm -hmm. we try to be a part of it. And I know that's very important to the Hamels who, who own the property because their family has been here since the Revolutionary War. Really? Yeah. So wow. the Hamels are, are very connected to the community and they want this farm to be a part of it. Too. Because they don't actually list themselves on the webs and no. on the pages. They're kind of like the asylum. They, yeah, they stay in the background and they, yeah. it's, it's about the farm and it's about the cheese. It's not about them. So in the wintertime, um, what are you able to do? I mean, you, are, do you, you do have some calves that come around that you're able to continue milking? Oh yeah, um, we'll be, the, adults the, the production the drops off a little bit in the winter uh, with eggs and with everything because it's, you know, a more dormant season and the animals slow down a little bit. But we'll definitely have milk, we'll still be making cheese and we'll have eggs. And, uh, and then there's the, the upkeep and the slow season is when you get to build your fences again and, and put in new pens. and and build up your plans for next year. So you're not taking off. You're not taking off for a month or two in the middle of winter. <laughs> it's a farm, so there's always somebody here. And there's always something to do. We have animals, so there's always something. So you think about um, Rutgers has been developing tomatoes, uh, Ramapo and things like that. So they take the best qualities of all these different species, wild species tomatoes and uh, or old species and they make Aramapo, which is disease resistant and uh, you know cold resistant. 
but in the old days we had all these different kinds of yes. things that had different qualities and different characteristics. We homogenize it down to this other creature who serves our needs for a, a good market hog, basically. Mm -hmm. But maybe you lose a little in taste, or for farmers, they used to, I think, have breeds that were maybe a little easier to work with. Um, maybe something that came in a little smaller. If you're a small farmer and you don't have a lot of help, you're not gonna be able to manage hogs like this. We've These are our offices. Okay. And then the farmer, the herdsman for the cows, lives over here with his family. And then on the upper farm, we have another herdsman for the animals up there. Yeah. We have our meetings outside. You know, we sit at the picnic table and enjoy the day. I, I, we're sort of blessed that we've got this nice right now coming this, up on Halloween. Yeah, this is perfect. Yeah. So many times in, in, when Halloween comes around, it's wet and cold. And I remember last year we were having a hurricane. We had a hurricane, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's a nice change. We were horseback riding and there were vegetable farmers all over where I grew up. And most of it's gone now. And it's kind of sad when you think how much farmland there was and how connected we all were with it. And, and now it's nice to see parents bringing their kids here and, and giving them the opportunity to see the animals and see how it all fits together. Women are finding second careers in farming. So, and, and young people are actually going to college majoring in agriculture to get into organic farming. Mm -hmm. um, so the hope would be that they would there would be a resurgence. I in feel farming. like everything's a pendulum swing. Yeah. That we go far over to this side and then you have people who say, No, I want to go back here. And so we just we never really lose anything, we just kinda of drift away and then we drift back.